I brought a lot of fact check documents here with me in case there's any Blackwater lawyers that happen to be living here in Troy. Uh, Blackwater has an army of lawyers to defend an army of mercenaries and in, in fact uh, the lawyers for uh, Blackwater uh, have, uh, have come from some very powerful Republican circles. The original lawyer that Blackwater had working for them uh, was none other than Fred Fielding who is now uh, President Bush's White House counsel defending him against the attorney purge scandal and you know, all, all sorts of other activity. Uh, the current lawyer of record for Blackwater is Kenneth Starr. Uh, the man who led the impeachment charge against uh, President Clinton. And in fact, a few weeks ago, I had a letter from, uh, from Blackwater's lawyers, uh, one of their many law firms. Uh, and the letter said, you know, we, we respect your First Amendment right to criticize uh, Blackwater, but can you please take down your website? Uh, we, had start, we had started a website called blackwaterbook.com to have information about the, the book and the company and the sort of archive of information and materials, et cetera. Uh, and they were, they were saying that they didn't want us to use the, the, uh, the name Blackwater to criticize the company. And they cited some ridiculous uh, corporate competition clause as though I'm, you know, as though they're making cereal and I'm trying to, you know, get a mercenary army up and running. Well, I don't, I don't even though I did write a book, I, it's, it's sort of against my nature to uh, read uh, anything. I, I prefer to just talk to the folks that are here. Uh, but I do want to start tonight by reading something from early on in the book because it's a, it was a definitive incident uh, in the occupation of Iraq, and it's perhaps the most famous incident involving uh, what are referred to broadly as private contractors. And it, it happened uh, about three years ago last month. Um, and then I'll get into the bigger picture of the company and where things stand right now. So it begins on the morning of March 31st, 2004, 9.30 a.m. in Fallujah, Iraq. When the four Americans rolled into Fallujah in their two Piero jeeps, the Iraqi Mujahideen in the city of mosques were waiting for them. The main drag that cuts through the city is lined with restaurants, cafes, and souks. And on ordinary days, throngs of people mill around. But early that morning, a small group of masked men had detonated an explosive device, clearing the streets and causing shopkeepers to shutter their stores. From the moment the convoy of Americans entered the city limits, the men stood out driving vehicles known as bullet magnets and sporting wraparound glasses and Tom Cruise haircuts. Shortly after they entered Fallujah, the jeeps began to slow. To their right were shops and markets, to the left open space. They'd hit some sort of a roadblock. As the vehicles came to a standstill, a grenade was hurled at the rear jeep, quickly followed by the rip of machine gun fire. Bullets tore through the side of the rear Piero like salt through ice, fatally wounding the two men inside. As the blood gushed from them, mass gunmen moved in on the jeeps, unloading cartridges of ammo and pounding their way through the windshield. Chants of Allahu Akbar, God is great, filled the air. Soon, more than a dozen young men who'd been hanging out in front of a local kebab shop joined in the frenzy. By the time the rear jeep was shot up, the Americans in the lead vehicle realized that an ambush was underway. They tried to flee, but it was too late. The crowd quickly swelled to more than 300 people as the original attackers faded into the side streets of Fallujah. Their jeeps were soon engulfed in flames. The scorched bodies of the Americans were pulled out, and men and boys literally tore them apart limb from limb. In front of the TV cameras, a young man held a small sign emblazoned with a skull and crossbones that declared in English, Fallujah is the graveyard of the Americans. The mob hung the charred, lifeless remains of the Americans from a bridge over the Euphrates, where they would remain for hours, forming an eerily iconic image that was seen on televisions throughout the world. Thousands of miles away in Washington, D.C., President Bush was on the campaign trail, speaking at a fundraising dinner. This collection of killers is trying to shake our will, the president told his supporters. America will never be intimidated by thugs and assassins. We're aggressively striking the terrorists in Iraq. We will defeat them there so we do not have to face them in our own country. The next morning, Americans woke up to the news of the gruesome killings. Iraqi mob mutilates four American civilians was a typical newspaper headline. Somalia was frequently invoked, referring to the incident in October of 1993 when rebels in Mogadishu shot down two Black Hawk helicopters, killed 18 American soldiers, and dragged some of them through the streets, prompting the U.S. to withdraw its forces. But unlike Somalia, the men killed in Fallujah were not members of the U.S. military, at least not active duty, nor were they civilians, as many news outlets reported. They were highly trained private soldiers, sent to Iraq by a secretive mercenary company based in the wilderness of North Carolina, 
Its name is Blackwater USA. For most people, it was the first they'd ever heard of armed private forces operating in a US war zone. And yet, over the deaths of these four private soldiers, the US would turn around and destroy an entire city. In many ways, it was the week that the war turned, that the Iraqi resistance was in flame that still haunts the occupation forces to this day. Within days of the ambush of the four Blackwater men, the US began to surround the city of Fallujah. And the Marines on the ground had been in and out of Fallujah at the time. They weren't even in the center anymore. And they were trying to take what they referred to as a hearts and minds approach to the city. And you can debate what you think the Marines meant by hearts and minds, but it was clear that the commanders on the ground didn't want to go in full force to Fallujah because they felt that it would result in a bloodbath. Well, the White House turned around and essentially ordered a siege of the city. So if you remember at the time, in, in March, April 2004, the big story in Iraq was this handover of sovereignty to the Iraqi government. And Paul Bremer, Bush's man on the ground, was intent on getting sovereignty, they used it in that term, handed over to the Iraqis by June of 2004 so that he could kind of escape the country and declare a victory, just as Bush had declared mission accomplished when the fighting was really just beginning. So Bush orders the, the Marines to surround the city, and, and teams from the Psychological Operations Division started to come into Fallujah. And they began to think up the filthiest insults that they could hurl through loudspeakers, have translated through loudspeakers to yell at Iraqis inside the city before they had actually taken it. And so they would, they would yell these insults out of these big megaphones. And sometimes they would play music from ACDC or Guns N' Roses. And when Iraqis would come out and fire their weapons, the US troops would gun them down. And they started referring to it, the US troops did on the ground, as Lala Fallujah. Early on in the siege of Fallujah, US helicopter fired a Hellfire missile at the base of a minaret of a mosque. And then that was followed by an F-16 coming in and dropping a 500-pound bomb uh, on the mosque compound. And the siege of Fallujah had begun. Within days, hundreds of people had been killed. Thousands and thousands of people were forcibly expelled from their homes. The US carried out an almost unimaginable 37,000 airstrikes in a matter of a few days, destroying about 19,000 of Fallujah's 40,000 buildings. A friend of mine, an unembedded uh, independent journalist, Dar Jamail, was actually able to make it into the city during the siege uh, with another uh, unembedded reporter. And they went in with a humanitarian delegation. And they reported that US snipers were firing at ambulances trying to go and retrieve the wounded from the center, center of the streets. And he also said that a stench had overtaken the city of Fallujah and that the smell was uh, rotting flesh of people that had been killed and their bodies left in the streets. And that dogs were starting to move in on piles of bodies and eat them. And Dar also said that the residents of Fallujah had taken two massive football fields and turned them into mass graves. And so you have this first siege of Fallujah. And the response, the end result of that siege of Fallujah was to outrage people across Iraq from both the Sunni and Shiite communities. And you had a massive uprising against the US forces. And if, if people wonder when the moment was that US troops started coming under fire in the way that they did that would result in 3,200 plus US soldiers being killed. It was this week that really inflamed the situation. Well, back in the US, while the siege of Fallujah was going on, the men who ran Blackwater kicked into high gear. The head of Blackwater, Eric Prince, turned to an old friend of his who was a senior partner at a powerful Republican lobbying firm, one of the K Street Project Jewels. It was a company called Alexander Strategy Group. It was started by former senior staffers of Tom DeLay, who at the time was the House Majority Leader. It also had ties to Jack Abramoff. So Eric Prince from Blackwater gets this lobbying firm, Alexander Strategy Group. And within a week, he was sitting down with other Blackwater executives, with the men who literally ran Congress at the time. And what was said at those meetings, what came out of them, is not a matter of public record. And none of the participants will talk about it. But Senator John Warner the chair at the time of the Senate Armed Services Committee said that uh, Blackwater and other contractors are our silent partner in the war on terror. Blackwater, by June of 2004, the men get killed March 31st, 2004. By June of 2004, Blackwater was awarded a $320 million contract to provide diplomatic security for the US State Department. I just got back documents on the Freedom of Information Act request that I filed some time ago and determined that since June of 2004, Blackwater has been contracted to the tune of three quarters of a billion dollars 
just by the US State Department. That doesn't count its work for the military, it doesn't count its work for the CIA, for private companies, for other agencies of the US government. Three quarters of a billion dollars on one State Department arrangement Blackwater has won. And this was a company that 10 years ago didn't even exist. 10 years ago, this company didn't exist. Today, it's the Praetorian Guard of the Bush administration's so-called war on terror. And I want to talk a little bit about the history of this company, how it started, how it rose up, because in many ways, the story of Blackwater is the story of the future of not only warfare and the US war machine, but in many ways, the, the future of US democracy and the sovereignty of other nations. Blackwater was started by this guy, Eric Prince. He's believed to be one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest uh, person ever to serve in the elite US Navy SEALs. Comes from a very powerful Republican, Christian, conservative family in the state of Michigan. Eric Prince's father was a guy named Edgar Prince, and he was a pull yourself up by your bootstraps capitalist. He built up this incredible manufacturing empire in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in Michigan. It was called Prince Manufacturing. They serviced the auto industry, and the invention that the company was perhaps best known for uh, was something that many of you probably have if you drive cars. Uh, they invented the now ubiquitous lighted sun visor. If you pull the visor down your car, it lights up. That's, you have a little bit of Blackwater's history in your vehicle. Uh, they also had some uh, inventions that didn't work out, like a ham deboning machine. Um, so young, young Eric Prince, the future founder of Blackwater, grows up in this household where he sees his father not only running a very successful business, but using that business as a cash generating engine to fuel and fund the rise of not only the Republican Revolution of 1994 that swept Newt Gingrich to power in the contract with America, uh, but also what we now know as the religious right or the Christian conservative movement in this country. Uh, Eric Prince's father gave $400,000, the seed money, to Gary Bauer, uh, the man who's on a rampage against SpongeBob, gave him $400,000 to start the Family Research Council. Gary Bauer, of course, regularly runs for president as the furthest to the right he could get without falling off the cliff. Um, the family also provided significant funding to uh, James Dobson and his focus on the Family Prayer Warrior Network. Uh, Eric Prince's sister, Betsy DeVos, uh, well, I let it slip there, Betsy Prince married Dick DeVos, the heir to the Amway Corporation, the single greatest bankrollers of the Republican Revolution. These guys use their home products company as essentially a, an organizing network uh, to, to build uh, this Republican Revolution. They gave millions and millions of dollars to ultimately shape the future of the country, which they did very, very successfully. Uh, young Eric Prince, who would go on to found Blackwater, was an early intern at the Family Research Council, but also at the White House of George H.W. Bush, but he complained that it wasn't conservative enough for him, and he cited gay issues, the budget, and the environment. He also was, a, uh, was an intern, although later he would claim he was a defense analyst, uh, but he was an intern uh, for Representative Dana Rohrabacher, conservative Republican of California. Rohrabacher is an interesting guy. He was a senior aide to Ronald Reagan uh, when Reagan was president. He was also one of his top speech writers. Uh, he left the White House and then ran for Congress, won a congressional seat, and before he started serving his congressional term, he went over to Afghanistan to fight against the Soviets on the side of the Mujahideen. This is Representative Dana Rohrabacher. These were the people that peppered the political landscape of young Eric Prince. In the 90s, Eric Prince goes off, he joins the US Navy SEALs, he's deployed in Haiti, Bosnia, the Mediterranean, but in the mid-1990s, tragedy hits his family. His father dies of a heart attack suddenly, his wife has cancer. Eric Prince leaves the SEALs, goes back to Michigan to try to help the family sort through the business. What they ultimately decide through their deliberations is that they're going to sell Prince Manufacturing for $1.35 billion in cash. Eric Prince takes his share of the family fortune, heads out to North Carolina, gets together with a bunch of his buddies from the Special Forces community, like-minded guys, and in December of 1996, they incorporate Blackwater Lodge and Training. That was the original name of the company. It was built on 5,000 acres near the Great Dismal Swamp of North Carolina. And a lot of people think, oh, Blackwater, it sounds so ominous. It must be some you know, term from the SEALs or a covert operations term. It actually, by all accounts of people involved with the founding, was just a sort of tip of the hat to the dark waters of the swamp uh, near the 5,000 acres upon which Blackwater was built. And in the beginning, the, the, the company sort of was, they envisioned sort of two roles for it. On the one hand, it was meant to be a sort of sportsman's paradise where gun enthusiasts could come and fire off their weapons. Uh, but also, early company literature indicates that they were anticipating what they referred to as accelerated government outsourcing of firearms and security uh, related training. Uh, and Blackwater's early days were rather quiet until April of 1999 when the Columbine shootings happened. 
Blackwater responded to the Columbine shootings by creating a mock high school uh, on their compound, and they called it Are You Ready High? Uh, and they invited law enforcement agents from around the country to come to Moyoc, North Carolina, and train in how to face down against school violence. And it was the first of almost annual tragedies that would benefit Blackwater. The next year, the USS Cole was bombed off the coast of Yemen, and Blackwater was awarded a $35 million contract from the US Navy to train sailors on how to defend their vessels against those kinds of attacks. But it wasn't until 9-11 when the big money started rolling in for Blackwater and the company started to engage in mercenary activities. Um, Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater, was on, uh, to my knowledge, one television program his entire career. And you can guess what network he went to after 9-11. He, he went to Fox News. He was on Bill O'Reilly's show, The O'Reilly Factor, and he says after 9-11, I was starting to get a little cynical about how seriously people took the business of training and security. Now the phone is ringing off the hook. One of the early calls that came into Blackwater after 9-11 was from the Central Intelligence Agency, which contracted Blackwater to go into Afghanistan in the early stages of operations there, and that began Blackwater's work as a mercenary company. In fact, Eric Prince, he's only 37 years old right now, Eric Prince went in with that initial Blackwater deployment to Afghanistan. They were positioned in Shkin along the Pakistan border. And so this is the, the, the beginning stages of this mercenary operation. And at this point, I think we should back up for a second because what we're looking at here is the fulfillment of, a, of what uh, Rumsfeld likes to call a revolution in military affairs. It goes all the way back to the, to the early 1990s. Dick Cheney's defense secretary, the end of the Gulf War, one of the last things he does before leaving office and joining Halliburton was to commission a study from a division of Halliburton, the company he would go on to head. He paid Halliburton $5 million to essentially create a market for itself and other war contractor companies. Halliburton's job, the division of Halliburton, the job of that study was to, to look at how to privatize the military bureaucracy, essentially privatize everything except the combat, uh, except what they call mission critical activities. All through the Clinton administration, that privatization agenda was placed on the fast track. You know, people, people complain about Halliburton, Cheney. Well, who do you think gave Halliburton those massive contracts in the 90s? It was the Clinton administration that awarded Halliburton massive contracts to operate in the Balkans and elsewhere. And so when Rum Rumsfeld comes to office uh, in 2000, he gives a major address at the Pentagon, and he says, it's early on in his tenure, and he says, because governments can't die, we need to find ways for the bureaucracy to adapt and improve. And he's speaking to the, to the men who would be running his Pentagon, and he says that, I've come not to attack the Pentagon, but to liberate it. We need to save it from itself. He gave that speech on September 10th, 2001. The next day was 9-11. And what Rumsfeld said during that address, he laid out his vision for what became known as the Rumsfeld Doctrine. You have a scaled back military, a small footprint approach, you lean on the private sector for accelerated technology, and you expand the use of your private forces in the war zone. And of course, Rumsfeld was a key participant in the Project for a New American Century, the neoconservative vision. And they said in their, in their founding document that short of a moment like a new Pearl Harbor, this agenda will take a long time to fulfill. Well, the day after Rumsfeld gives that major address, they have the spark that would create a blank canvas on which they could write their dreams. And so Blackwater goes into Afghanistan in the early stages of uh, U.S. operations there. But when it really became a central player in the war on terror was when U.S. tanks rolled into Baghdad in March of 2003. They brought with them the largest army of private contractors ever deployed in a modern war zone. During the 1991 Gulf War, the ratio of contractors to soldiers was about 60 to 1. Rumsfeld was intent on making it 1 to 1. And so the U.S. tanks rolled in with 100,000 contractors. Paul Bremer hits the ground in uh, the summer of 2003, Bush's envoy in Baghdad. They don't task the U.S. military with protecting Paul Bremer or the senior occupation officials. They turn to Blackwater and award the company a $27.7 million no-bid contract to provide what was called diplomatic security for Paul Bremer. It would include helicopters and armored vehicles and multiple personal security details. That contract was the first major contract that Blackwater would win in Iraq that would lead to the $750 million uh, of contracts. And the Fallujah ambush uh, happened about a year into Blackwater's job of, uh, of guarding Paul Bremer. And I've gotten to know the families of those four men who were killed very well. 
And it's an interesting case study in who signs up for this kind of work and what they think they're getting into. All four of those families thought that their loved ones were going over to guard Paul Bremer, every single one of them. Uh, what they died for that day was guarding empty flatbed trucks, going to pick up kitchen equipment for a catering company called ESS. Had nothing to do with Paul Bremer. Had nothing to do with diplomatic security. Had nothing to do with serving any kind of national security interests of the United States. They were literally working for a private catering company going to pick up kitchen equipment in the war zone. And so these families, they start asking questions to Blackwater. They, they, they say they had no presumed malice on the part of the company. They thought that they would call them up and they would get answers and they were in mourning and they call Blackwater and they say that the company was giving them the runaround. It's acting suspicious about it. Wouldn't be straight with them. So they kept calling and calling and calling. And eventually Blackwater is receiving so many phone calls from these families and they're not answering their questions according to the families that they say, okay, listen, we're going to fly all of you out to our, our beautiful 7,000 acre, it now has become private military facility in Moyak, North Carolina. We'll have a memorial service for your loved ones and we'll answer all of your questions. So the families fly out there. They go out to Moyak, North Carolina. And they said that when they hit the ground in North Carolina that it was like stepping into some sort of Orwellian scenario because they said Blackwater assigned each of the families a minder of sorts. Reminds me of my days in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And they, they would kind of guide them around and if they would start talking amongst each other, the families about the ambush and questions they had, they say that the Blackwater guys would sort of steer the conversation in a different direction. And eventually they, they, they sit down and they have this meeting where they're gonna answer all these questions. And one of the mothers of, of one of the guys killed, her name is Donna Zavko. Uh, her son's name was Jerry Zavko. She starts asking the Blackwater representatives for her son's belongings. She, I, my Jerry had two duffel bags, where his duffel bags? And she said that they, were, they weren't giving her, her the duffel bags. They wouldn't answer any questions about it. They were being kind of hostile with her, and she didn't quite understand why. And then she said, and I know you did an incident report. I know that there's paperwork on what happened that day in Fallujah. I want to see it. I want to see what the company's investigation found about the death of my Jerry. And she said she persisted in her questioning, and eventually a Blackwater representative stands up and says it's a classified document and you'll have to sue us to get it. you have to sue us to get it. And so that woman, Donna Zavko, got to know the mother of another one of the guys killed named Katie Halvinston. Her son was the youngest person ever to complete the elite Navy SEAL BUDS program. 12 years in the SEALs, seven of them as an instructor, a world-class pentathlete. Trained Demi Moore for her movie G.I. Jane on the Navy SEALs. He was one of those guys killed in Iraq. So these two mothers get to know each other. They start comparing notes and they start hearing from some of the guys that served with their sons over there, and they said that, you know, there's a lot of fishy stuff about this operation. They were supposed to be in armored vehicles. They were in Piero Jeeps. They were supposed to have three man, men to a vehicle. There were only two that day. And they started hearing all of these disturbing things, and eventually they decide that if Blackwater's not going to answer our questions, we're going to sue Blackwater. And so in January of 2005, these four families, the families of those men, filed a groundbreaking wrongful death lawsuit against Blackwater. And they filed it in the state of North Carolina, Blackwater's home state where if it was heard in state court, there would be no cap on damages that a jury could award. Uh, it'd sort of be like a domino effect. Once the first war contractor falls, it sets off a chain reaction. Some people have talked about it being similar to the tobacco litigation of the 1990s. Well, what Blackwater does is enlists these powerful lawyers. Fred Fielding, the original lawyer on the case, now Bush's lawyer. And it's interesting because Blackwater has never taken on the specific allegations of the families. What those families say is that their loved ones signed a contract that said that we recognize we can be killed in the war zone or injured in the war zone and we won't hold Blackwater responsible. I have their contract and it lists uh, every manner of, of death that can befall a human being. Debris falling from the sky, decapitation by fixed wing aircraft or rotary. This is in their contract. Every possible way you could be killed. And they signed it and it says we won't sue Blackwater for our deaths explicitly in the contract. So you could say, oh, well, end of story. They knew what they were getting into. They were being well paid. They went over to the war zone voluntarily, unlike so many of these young people uh, who, who join up with the National Guard to fight floods and get sent over to Bakuba. Uh, so no, no sympathy for them. Ah, but there was another contract, the contract that governed their mission. And it said, these guys are going to be traveling three men to a vehicle. The vehicles are going to be armored vehicles. They're going to have heavy weaponry. They're going to have a chance to do a pre-trip risk assessment 24 hours uh, before. They're going to be able to get familiar with the territory that they were traveling in. The families say none of that was true. In fact, they say that Blackwater sent them on that mission that day without armored vehicles to save one and a half million dollars. And so Blackwater's response, no answering of questions, is, is, is to put forward a legal argument in, the, in this case where they say, we're not even going to address the merits of the lawsuit. We're just going to say to you, the court, we can't be sued. 
Donald Rumsfeld identified Blackwater and other contractors as a part of the US total force. So Blackwater's turned around in these proceedings and said, we should be entitled to the same immunity from civilian litigation that the military enjoys because we're part of the US total force. At the same time, Blackwater's lobbyists since 2004 have been leading a charge to try to prevent the military from, or Congress from placing Blackwater and other contractors under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the court-martial system. So you have a situation where Blackwater is explicitly saying, no court-martial, no civilian litigation. We're effectively above the law. And it's interesting because Fred Fielding, Ken Starr, powerhouse lawyers, they've twice gone to the US Supreme Court to try to get rid of this case. And twice, Bush's Supreme Court, with John Roberts as the Chief Justice, has rejected it. So the, 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 the way is now paved for this case to go forward in state court in North Carolina. It could start as early as May of 2007. What Blackwater did after failing to, to get the case thrown out is to file a counterclaim against the estates of those four men seeking $10 million. They filed a counterclaim against the estates of those four guys for $10 million, saying they had no right to sue us because those guys signed that contract. You know, this is this Christian business, Blackwater USA. What do you say to Rhonda Teague, the widow of Mike Teague? You say $10 million from your estate. What do you say to Katie Helvinston, the mother of Scott Helvinston? You say $10 million from his estate. What do you say to Donna Zabko, the mother of Jerry Zabko? $10, $10 million from the estate. How about answering questions of those four guys who thought they were going over to guard Paul Bremer and died for empty trucks? So th this, this is one case in a sea of, of, of stories about contractors. I don't know if any of you saw Steve Fainaru's excellent piece in the Washington Post over the weekend. It was a front page piece about a company called Triple Canopy. I encourage everyone to read it, but he quotes one contractor as saying before he went out on a mission that he wanted to go kill somebody that day because he was going on vacation the next day. Uh, also in the piece, uh, they quote another guy as saying, we, you know, it was unclear to us if any law applied to us, US, Iraqi, international law. This is the this is the sort of state of affairs with this legal vacuum over there right now. We have 126,000 private contractors. Hundreds of thousands have gone in and out of Iraq since March of 2003. You know how many have been prosecuted? Two. Two have been prosecuted. Neither of them were even armed contractors like those working for Blackwater. One's alleged to have stabbed someone in a kitchen. The other uh, just pled guilty to possession of child pornography on his computer at Abu Ghraib. There have been 64 court-martials of US soldiers. There have been two indictments of private contractors, and it's not for abuses committed against Iraqis. It's, it's for one, a sort of, you know, the, the possession of child pornography, and the other, allegedly stabbing someone. How many contractors have been killed in Iraq? Do we know? Well, we think that at least 780 have been killed because we pay for their insurance. They get insurance under something called the Defense Base Act, and so we know that 780 families of private contractors have applied for death benefits under this federal insurance. We know that 7,600 have been wounded. But start to think about this for a second when you wonder, why does Bush use these forces? Their numbers don't get counted in the official death toll. Their injuries don't get counted in the official death toll. Their crimes go undocumented, unreported, unprosecuted, and ultimately unpunished. We've got. Uh, the military over there with 145,000 troops, they can't oversee those troops. They can't bring court martials against guilty parties for those. They go after the lowest rung on the ladder. How can we expect that then they're going to police another 126,000 contractors? The Bush administration uses these forces as political cover. They use it to subvert any kind of a democratic process in this country. Uh, and also, they use it to subvert the sovereignty of other countries. See, Blackwater portrays itself as a sort of all-American apple pie operation. One of the stories that I tell in the book is how beginning in late 2003, Blackwater started working with a Chilean recruiter, a guy named Jose Miguel Pizarro Ovalle. Pizarro goes down to, uh, to Chile, and he sets up two camps. And Blackwater sends down Americans to look at these Chileans in the camp. Chile said, we don't want to join the coalition of the willing. So the Bush administration turns to one of the most powerful among the coalition of the billing, Blackwater. They go in and recruit Chilean mercenaries and then ship them over to Iraq. In total uh, subversion of the democratically elected government of Chile and the sovereignty of that nation. Some of the men that Blackwater hired up had been trained and served under Pinochet's regime. In all, 750 Chileans made their way to Iraq 
because of this one recruiter. And I interviewed him and have a whole chapter about this in the book. In 2005, another mercenary company from Chicago went down to Honduras and set up shop there. In fact, they set up shop at Lepartique, which used to be the CIA's uh, base of operation in the 80s in Honduras, where Battalion 316 ran its operations. This mercenary company sets up a base at this old CIA facility in Honduras. Honduras pulls its troops out of Iraq after Negroponte was named ambassador. This company goes and hires some of those exact soldiers that their government had pulled out and sends them back to Iraq. So you, you, you see what's happening here. Colin Powell says the active duty military is about broken. They want to keep a draft off the table for political reasons. Most Americans now don't view this as a defensive war in Iraq or Afghanistan increasingly. And so what you do is you, you ignore the citizenry, you sidestep them, and you hire an army of private soldiers to wage offensive, aggressive wars that your home population is opposed to. You see, th this, is, this is an incredible threat right now to democratic process in this country. And so you would think, well, the Democrats have now swept the power in Congress and they're gonna start really cracking down on it. Wrong. Both Democrat bills in the House and in the Senate totally ignore the contractors, 100%. The Democrats can't even figure out how to withdraw official U.S. troops, and they're totally ignoring the 126,000 contractors. According to their plan, even if Bush didn't veto it, you could have 40,000 U.S. troops on the ground in Iraq in late 2008 and an unlimited number of contractors operating in the war. And, 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 and lest we think this is just about Iraq and Afghanistan and far off places, Blackwater increasingly has its sights set on domestic deployments inside of the U.S. I was down in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. I'm standing on uh, Bourbon Street in the French Quarter talking to two New York City cops who had come down with a delegation of New York firefighters to try to help. And I'm standing there talking to these police officers and an unmarked car pulls up next to us. It was a small compact car, no license plates on it. These three massive guys get out of the car. They have flak jackets on, khaki, head to toe, M4 guns, pistol strapped to the leg, extra ammunition wrap around sunglasses, and they walk up to the cops and they say, where are the rest of the Blackwater guys? Where are the rest of the Blackwater guys? And the cops say, oh, they're just down the street. Without skipping a beat, the cops, oh yeah, they're down the street, as though they'd always been there. And I said to the cops, you know, Blackwater, you mean, you mean like the guys over in, in Iraq? And they said, oh yeah, they're all over the place down here. So I, I walk further down Bourbon Street, and sure enough, I find a group of Blackwater guys. They were wearing Blackwater baseball caps and dressed like the other guys. And I just strike up a conversation with them. I said, you know, what are you guys doing down here? Came down to help. Well, who, who sent you down here? Our boss. How many of you? How many guys are down here? Well, there's about 180 of us. Wow. You know, no national guard, no national guard, no FEMA. I don't even know if FEMA's there yet. No FEMA, no national guard, no humanitarian relief operation. Blackwater on the streets of New Orleans. So, in the course of this conversation, I said, you know, okay, you, your, your boss sent you down here. Are you are you under any authority down here? I mean, are you working for the government? fumbling around, and then one guy pulls out a gold law enforcement badge, and he says, I was deputized by the governor of the state of Louisiana. He said, we have you know, authority to use lethal force. And I said, what's, what's your mission down here? And they said, we're here to confront criminals, stop looters. You know, we remember what the definition of a looter was at the time. Um, and so you've got these Blackwater guys down there. And I said, where, you know, where are you guys, where are you staying? And because I had seen them emptying out someone's apartment, I thought maybe they had set up like a base of operations. And, so we're, we're in a camp organized by the Department of Homeland Security outside of the city. I said, so are, are you on federal contract down here? I mean, he said he was deputized, but are you on federal contract? And they said, uh, oh, that's way above our pay grade. Meanwhile, this guy's on the, another Blackwater guy's on his cell phone, and he's saying to, I assume, a colleague of his, he's like, oh, you don't want to come down here for Blackwater. They're only paying three fifty dollars a day, plus per diem, you know, as in other companies are going to pay you more. And I says, that, that's how much you guys are making? He's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a vacation from Iraq. And, you know, I was like, oh, were you just in Iraq? Yeah, two weeks ago, guarding Negroponte, you know? I mean, he was guarding Negroponte in Baghdad, and now he's, he's in Hurricane Katrina talking about, on the one hand, it's a vacation, on the other hand, there's not enough action down here. Uh, and so myself and a couple of other reporters start asking the federal government, did you hire Blackwater? Because you realize what the issue would be, I mean, among many. They hired Blackwater because there's no National Guard. And why is there no National Guard? Oh, because they're over in Iraq and Afghanistan. So after denying that they had hired them, saying we have sufficient security forces you know, to, to take care of New Orleans, they were forced to admit that in fact they had hired Blackwater. The Department of Homeland Security, Federal Protective Service, had hired Blackwater. I was able to get Blackwater's contracts in the hurricane zone. They said they were making $350 a day on the ground. They billed U.S. taxpayers, Blackwater did, $950 per man per day. $950 per man per day. 
The reporting we did sparked a congressional investigation. The Department of Homeland Security did an internal review and they determined that it was the best value to the taxpayer, $9.50 per man per day. What I want to know also is where's that $600 going? $350 plus per diem on the ground, $9.50 billing taxpayers. At one point, Blackwater had 600 men, and I assume a handful of women, stretching from Texas through Mississippi and the Gulf. 600. They were raking in about $240,000 a day during the Hurricane Katrina operation. Remember all of the harassment of welfare mamas for having $2,000 debit cards. Well, what about Blackwater's $950 daily debit card for each of its men? But don't worry, Blackwater gave back. In November of 2005, they held a Hurricane Katrina fundraiser, proceeds benefiting the Red Cross. The keynote speaker was Paul Bremer. They raised a whopping $138,000 for the Red Cross, slightly half than their daily take in the hurricane zone. Blackwater viewed its operations in New Orleans as so lucrative that they started a whole new division of the company for domestic operations. A couple weeks ago, they opened a new military facility, private military facility in Mount Carroll, Illinois, near the Illinois-Wisconsin border. They're trying to open another one east of San Diego, out in California, but they're meeting fierce local resistance. In fact, half of the registered voters in the county where Blackwater is trying to expand near San Diego have signed a petition opposing Blackwater. They went to a meeting, a public meeting, that, that was normally just a routine bureaucratic procedure. 125 people lined the road outside of the meeting, stopped Blackwater. This is in a county with 900 residents. 125 people stopped Blackwater. These people started emailing me months ago, saying, you know, we've heard this rumor that Blackwater's coming to our community. I've been corresponding with them, and more and more emails start to come in, and next thing you know, there, there's an uprising against them in this small place, and Congressman Duncan Hunter, a powerful Republican running for Congress, is now intervening on Blackwater's behalf in this. They're trying to get it pushed through, because Blackwater's try, is essentially making a diamond around the United States. 7,000 acre military facility in North Carolina, moving into Illinois, going out to California, already in the Gulf. It's a diamond around the country. They met last year with Arnold Schwarzenegger about doing disaster response in the event of an earthquake in California. The company has applied for operating licenses in all of the coastal states of the United States. This is a company that is very forward thinking. They're at the cutting edge of what, of, of what they call fourth generation warfare, asymmetric warfare. They're the Praetorian Guard for the Bush administration. Nine countries around the world, Blackwater has men deployed, including, including in Azerbaijan, not far from Iran. Blackwater got sent in there by the Bush administration in July of 2004 to set up a command and control center in Baku, modeled after the Department of Homeland Securities. They took over an old Soviet special forces base. They trained and, and, and set up a 90-man Azerbaijani unit, modeled after the Navy SEALs, to patrol the Caspian Sea. When Tehran heard that Blackwater was in the region, they sent their own special unit of the Navy into the Caspian Sea to face down against Blackwater. This is a company that is at the cutting edge of the current wars and potentially the next war. You know, some have suggested that this could be a facility that Blackwater set up in Azerbaijan could be used as a forward operating base in an attack against Iran. At the same time Blackwater went in there, Bush sent in a company called Washington Group International to set up two massive surveillance towers, one facing toward Iran, one facing toward Chechnya. So Azerbaijan near Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. Blackwater now is pushing to be sent into Darfur as a privatized peacekeeping force. They, they talk about John Jaweed be gone, send us in as the anti-genocide patrol. Last October, Bush lifted sanctions, partial sanctions on southern Sudan, the Christian region. And the, uh, the southern Christian uh, Sudanese regional representative in Washington let the cat out of the bag to the Washington Times and said, now that these sanctions have been lifted, it paves the way for Blackwater to come over and start training the southern Christian forces in Sudan. So they're, they're Iraq, Afghanistan, Azerbaijan. They want to be deployed now in Sudan. And then over here in the United States, stretching around the country. So we have a, a dire, dire situation where we have this radical privatization agenda. We see it in schools. We see it in prisons. We see it in law enforcement. And now we're seeing it in the US war machine. And you know, Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater, he always puts a noble spin on everything. And he says, you know, my employees all take an oath, the same oath that the military takes to uphold the US Constitution. You know, they, they want us to operate on this faith-based initiative. That somehow Eric Prince's definition of patriotism is gonna match your definition of patriotism. That somehow his definition of only acting in the interests of the United States is going to match your definition of only acting in the interests of the United States. He says, we don't wanna take over the military. 
We're like the FedEx of the national security apparatus. When you really want a package to get somewhere, do you send it through the postal service or do you send it by FedEx? That's literally what Eric Prince has said about his company's role. He's proposed creating a contractor brigade, as, as, as though they don't already have a, a, a contractor army over in Iraq, a contractor brigade to supplement the work of the active duty US military. You know, we're, we're at a crucial time right now because these guys are many, many steps ahead of most political people in this country. They're certainly far ahead of the anti-war movement. They're way ahead of any congressional Democrats in terms of their forward thinking. They're deeply embedded in the Christian right. They're deeply embedded in a, in a war against what they view as secularism uh, in the United States. And so I think all of us have a question before us today, is what, are, what is our response going to be to this? You know, the fact is that the, the, the Democrat, I'm not a Democrat or Republican, I'm a journalist, but the Democrats swept to power in Congress on a pledge that they were actually going to change the state of affairs, that there actually would be an end to the war in sight. And what they're doing right now is making these proclamations, Barack Obama, no chicken with the troops, Carl Levin, we would never defund the war. How about defunding the war profiteers? That would be a start. Is it supporting the troops to pay them twenty-eight to $40,000 a year and, and pay the well-paid guys from Blackwater $30,000 a month? What kind of corporate welfare machine do we have operating here? How is it that the Democratic Congress is essentially doing the same as the Republican Congress when it comes to these contractors, which is nothing? Henry Waxman held a hearing on February 7th on contractors. That was the start of a process, but the Democrats are narrowly focused on the issue of oversight, transparency, fiscal responsibility. How about the privatization of war? How about a shadow army? How about subverting the democratic process in this country? The only congressperson who has called for a total withdrawal of US contractors from Iraq is Dennis Kucinich. It's sort of like this lone ranger guy in Congress. But this, this, this isn't the stuff of wacky leftism here. This cuts across the political spectrum. I've never gotten so many emails that begin, I never thought I'd be writing an email like this to someone like you. And, and, and it's signed, and it's signed from, from military folks, it's signed from contractors who've been over there and say you wouldn't believe what's going on. At almost every talk I've given, at least one or two people who served with private war contractors in Iraq has come to the talk. And I really appreciate talking to those guys because they've seen it firsthand. And I think that, you know, in, in closing, I hope that we can have some kind of a dialogue here, but there's one concrete thing that I think all of us can do, and that is whatever your position is on the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq, I, I don't see this as a Democrat, Republican, conservative, or liberal issue. We have a small window here where there are people who will listen, uh, in some cases, in Congress right now. This is an issue that I think cuts across the political spectrum in this country. I, I think we need to encourage Congress to, A, cut off the funding for the war profiteers, and B, pass effective anti-mercenary legislation that delinks corporate profits from war making. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there was uh, some way we were supposed to do this, but I'm, I'm happy to just you know, have a discussion, so and whoever wants to ask, I guess, it, I guess that's how we're doing it. I was in Burlington, and I got heckled before I even started speaking, but it was, you know, someone who wanted to, didn't think I was going to say something negative about Hillary Clinton. They wanted to make sure that Hillary got slammed at the uh, talk. I said, don't worry, don't worry about it, buddy. Anyway, go ahead. I was going to raise all of my fingers because that's how many questions I have for you. Okay, well, I'll limit it to 17. <laughs> uh, let me start out by asking, how is this being financed? How does the money flow from Congress to these contractors? Can I answer that right now? Okay. Yeah. So in, in most cases, uh, the money is going through the Iraq supplemental uh, spending. Uh, I, for, I was investigating Blackwater's specific contract because it was with the U.S. State Department, and I thought it was possible that it was actually being paid out of the, the actual State Department budget. Uh, and, was, uh, and was told by the State Department that in fact it was being paid for out of the war funding uh, bills. So you know, the, the Democrats will continue to fund the war contractors as long as they pass those supplemental bills. And what's the full range of activities that these 100, 126,000 people who are not allegedly combat troops? Yeah, there's 126,000 contractors. Many of them, many, many thousands of them have nothing to do with a gun. 
Uh, they're dishwashers, they do laundry, they serve food to the troops, uh, they're involved with cleaning up Porta Johns, setting up Porta Johns, driving vehicles. The Government Accountability Office uh, estimates that there are 48,000 employees of private military companies, I call them mercenary firms in Iraq, 48,000. Um, Representative Jan Schakowsky, who's on the Select Intelligence Committee, estimates that between 20 to 25,000 uh, contractors are engaged in armed operations or some kind of uh, paramilitary or military engagements in Iraq, working for the U.S. There's tens of thousands of, of uh, private soldiers that have nothing to do directly with U.S. contracts. That's just with U.S. contracts. Somebody else, come on up. I, I think that one way of looking at it is to uh, also look back at, um, at Central America in the 80s, where the, if there is an unpopular war, um, you need a proxies to run it. So they used the Contras back then, and now they're using Blackwater. I urge people to go to their website, as Jeremy said. It's amazing. And actually, one of the things I noticed BlackwaterUSA.com. Yeah. yeah. You pay depending on how much ammunition you get when you right. get their courses. So you could, what, what would be the chances of have hearings in Congress? And, yeah. and what, would that do any good at all? Or? I mean, I, you know, I, I've never been a, a big believer that Congress is going to change much of anything. I do think, though, that, um, that this is a, a, a different sort of situation because I think that Regardless of what the position of the of the Democratic, uh, you know, of the politicians on the Democrat side is in terms of defunding the war, to me it's a no-brainer to defund the mercenaries, uh, and it, it should be a no-brainer to all to, to all Congress people. I mean, this is this is an outrageous, uh, you know, subversion of democracy. I think, and I think that uh, it's worth the campaign to try to get Congress to cut off the funding for the private troops in Iraq and withdraw them. I mean, that that would be a absolute first step that I would find rejection of almost indefensible by the, certainly by the Democrats, and I think by a lot of Republicans when their constituents find out about the extent of the spending on these mercenary armies. The other possible kind of resistance I was thinking, like there's been s such a growing movement against the School of the Americas. Right. Of course, now they're decentralizing and going to Panama or wherever, but um, w how well defended is the Blackwater camp and would a uh, demonstration there similar to the School of the Americas make any sense yeah. or be useful? Uh, the, the compound's pretty well defended. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> Have you uh, been there? Yeah, it's, well, they won't let me inside the compound, yeah. but um, yeah, you're you're gonna run in, you're gonna run into some uh, some authorities, let's say, uh, <laughs> when you get near it. I mean, it's in the it's in the middle of nowhere, basically near a swamp, and they know when you're coming. That should be one of the next frontiers of of the anti-war movement is to start direct uh, action, confrontation at some of these headquarters. Uh, I just wanted to say, first of all, I'm really uh, impressed with what you've done, and I think you have a lot of courage. Do you fear for your own safety reporting on this? Um, what do you do to safeguard it? Do you feel like people are at all following you around. I mean, I don't want to sound like a nut, but I, I feel nervous. You sound like my mom, not like a nut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she no. says the same thing. Yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, I, when I was calling some friends to ask them if they wanted to come to this tonight, I felt nervous just saying that on the phone. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, you don't know what's going on. Oh. And so I just was wondering, you know, how, how that affects you and, you know, if you're anxious or relaxed or... The other, the other day I was giving a talk in, uh, I don't even remember the name of the town, but it was at Stonehill College in Massachusetts. And uh, I was talking to some, uh, some very nice uh, older folks from the nation discussion group beforehand. And uh, they were, uh, the median age was probably about 80. And uh, I'm chatting with them and I know I, that becomes relevant in a second. I'm, just, I'm not just throwing something out here. And there's this guy standing who has a, a Navy SEAL Team 6 uh, bomber jacket on and he's standing next to me kind of staring at me and I was, feeling a little bit awkward and maybe nervous. And I was hoping that the nice women of the nation discussion group wouldn't leave. Uh, <laughs> and I, it became a thing where I started like asking them questions, like, so, so what, what's your favorite co cover of the nation magazine in the uh, past couple weeks? Um, and, and so they clear out, and this guy comes up to me, and um, he just kind of stares at me for a second. I thought he was gonna clock me, and he says, um, you know, I just uh, I was in the SEALs and I was a friend of Scott Halvinston's, one of the guys killed at Fallujah. And he said, I just read your book and I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for getting his story right and, uh, and the dignity that you uh, preserve for him. 
And uh, during the question and answer session, he got up and he said, um, asked the same question you did, and he said, you know, I'd like to, to offer to be your, your bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I anyway, he's a Navy SEAL, and I, I laughed, and the crowd laughed, and he goes, no, I'm serious. <laughs> um, anyway, that's, that, you know, the thing is that I, I try not to think about it. I mean, obviously these are, these are scary guys, and um, you know, I, I don't want to be consumed by the paralysis of analysis and worrying about who could do what. You know, I, I feel like my security is groups of people like this uh, that come out and support this work and keep independent media alive, but I won't deny that it's, you know, the thought doesn't, you know, it crosses your mind, but I try to just keep moving forward with it. And thanks for your comment. And, and lastly, I just want to know, as an individual, what can I specifically do to try to affect change, um, like legally? How can I appeal to people in a way that might move something through and, and change this? It's interesting because in the years that I've been uh, been a reporter and have been, you know, talking publicly, everyone, you know, always asks you, what can you do? And I have never been someone to say, well, call Congress or write a letter to the editor. I actually think that strategically right now, one of the best things that we can do is, is the quietest thing. Every letter that ends up in a newspaper around this country gets sent around by those mercenary companies on their listservs. It's incredible. They're very nervous about information right now. And I think that you know, the, the, the more that we press elected officials to stop ignoring this issue, the more that we raise it in our local newspapers are so important. Uh, the, the more that we try to inform ourselves, to read about it, to tell others about it, this, this is a winning issue here in, in, a, in a sea of, of, of very dark times. Uh, it's a winning issue because it, it, it is not a Democrat-Republican issue. It is, it's not an independent issue. It's, it, it cuts across the spectrum, and there are many reasons why people are against this. And so I don't think it's an act of futility to simply research it, write a, you know, a decent 350 to 500 word letter, and to get on the phone and talk to Congress people. I also think you know, that, that uh, having journalists who cover this stuff, inviting them you know, to your community is really important, and uh, you know, sending the stuff around on listservs. At, at this point, I think we're, we're, we're at the beginning stages of a, of a movement against this uh, corporate mercenary movement uh, that's, that's sort of taken the country by storm, and I think uh, we're in the fact-finding uh, phase of it and the dissemination phase of it. Jeremy, I'm curious about the rapport between enlisted people and the contractors. I mean, they must cross each other's paths, and there's a pay differential. And I'm, are they are the enlisted people less ignorant than the average American about this whole situation? Do they know who they are? Do they know what they're doing there? And just what is the feeling there? There's a couple of ways to, to look at that angle on things. I mean, one is General, General David Petraeus, uh, the head of the multinational forces in Iraq, uh, told Congress a few months ago uh, explicitly that without contractors, the occupation wouldn't be uh, sustainable. And, and so I think that you know, Bush finally found a commander that you know, agrees with him on that. Um, I think for the rank and file soldiers on the ground, there's a couple ways of looking at contractors. Uh, on the one hand, I think you could have a sense of resentment. You could say, well, these guys are in the same war zone as me. I've got this black jacket on from Vietnam. You know, my mom's having a bake sale to try to get me real body armor. Uh, you know, my buddy got killed for not having it. He's sitting in the back of a truck, and these guys are running around with, you know, state-of-the-art weapons and six-figure salaries, some of them. Not all the contractors get paid like that, and not all of the U.S. contractors working for them get paid like that, but a lot of guys get paid six-figure salaries, a good part, portion of it tax-free. And so I think you have the resentment factor, but you also have a drainage of the active-duty military, particularly special forces, you get paid $70,000, $80,000 to be a Navy SEAL, you can go over and make twice that uh, working for Blackwater or another company. Uh, and so the Special Operations Command is talking about a, a real problem with the morale on the ground, uh, with retention of uh, Special Forces guys. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, it's so pervasive now to leave the actual military and go over to the private sector, the slang for it is going Blackwater. Um, if you go to any company, not just to Blackwater, and there, you know, there's about 180 known mercenary companies operating in Iraq, uh, it creates a real morale problem, I think, for the troops on the ground, and it also is a, another way of siphoning resources away from, uh, from public institutions with some semblance of accountability. All right, well, thank you, everyone, very much for coming. Really appreciate it. I'm happy to stick around and talk to people and sign books if you want to buy them or if you already have it. Thank you very much, Jeremy Scahill. Hope to see you back in Troy again very soon.